Welcome back to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. I am Dale, and I am joined by Christoph. Hey, buddy. Hey, Captain. How you doing? It's good to see you this morning. I am uh, fantastic, and I hope you are too. Well, I didn't want to start at fantastic because I wanted a place to, I wanted to get to fantastic as we proceed with the episode. I'm afraid that there's nowhere to go but down for you, but that's okay. Still going to be a good episode. Oh, no, there's higher levels of fantastic, really? like uh, awesome, and uh, other things. I don't usually reach those heights, so maybe I'm just ignorant of that. So, well, let's, let's continue, and we'll see how fantastic we can make it. Well, I mean, we're about to start talking about battles, so how can you not be fantastic about that? That's true. That's true. I never should have doubted you. All right, so... We are on the American Revolutionary War for a little bit longer. We're actually very close to the end. I'm excited to see how it turns out. Yeah, we win. Oh, well, you just spoiled it. That's okay. I had a feeling. It was spoiled a few hundred years ago now. Yeah, I guess there is a statute of limitations on that, so. Yeah. So we are in the southern area of operations the Southern Theater, and we're going to start today with the Battle of the Rice Boats. So, are you ready to get underway? Yes. I'm curious about these rice boats. All right. So, this is going to take us to April 1775. So, following, you know, the start of the conflict, or I don't know. Is it a police action? What, this Revolutionary <laughs> War? I think there were some declarations, right? I mean... I, I was oh. making fun of our wars in the future of this that are, quote-unquote, police actions. You know, like Vietnam. Yeah. Well, you got to get Congress involved, and when you don't, you got to call it something else because people are shooting at each other. It's like, well, it's yeah. not a war... Yeah, I got you. So this is going to be after the battles of Lexington and Concord. This is when the... So this is after the battles of Lexington and Concord. The Americans surrounded the city of Boston, placing it under siege. Even though they weren't able to completely encircle it. So the sea lane for resupply was still open. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so kind of a siege, but not a complete siege. So news of this and the Battle of Bunker Hill, this, you know, encouraged everybody else within the colonies to say, you know what? The UK can just bite my boot. I think that's an appropriate term. Yes. Now, Georgia had actually managed to remain relatively neutral before for these events. Hmm. The Georgia Provincial Congress came into power during the summer of 75 and then stripped Georgia's royal governor, a guy named James Wright, of his powers. The Wright had actually requested naval Pre- had requested a naval presence near Savannah, but the request was intercepted, and they substituted his request with a dispatch saying that he did not need help. That's awesome. <laughs> so a crisis point is reached in Georgia when a British man of war, or when British men of war began arriving at Tybee Island in January of 76. Hmm. Three ships were spotted at anchor off Tybee Island on January 12th. And by January 18th, it had increased. They had the HMS Cherokee, the HMS Siren, the HMS Raven, the HMS Tamor, and a number of smaller vessels there. Now, Wright had 
told a guy named Joseph Clay, he was like, you know what, guys? That fleet had been sent to publish the rebels. The thing is, though, the ships were the beginnings of a fleet assembled to acquire provisions in Savannah oh, for the British troops in Boston. It's a looting party. Yes. In December, General William Howey had ordered an ex had ordered an expedition to purchase rice and other provisions in Georgia. So by early February, the entire fleet is now assembled off the island. Wow. It was under the command of a guy named Captain Andrew Barclay. He was on the HMS Scarborough. He also had with him the HMS Hinchinbrook and two transports. He had the HMS Whitby, Whitby and the HMS Cemetery, which had about 200 British regular uh, army units from the 400 foot with Major James Grant. Huh. And all this is off the coast of Georgia, huh? Yes, right there next to Tybee Island. That that's a big presence, and I I'm I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of the residents there. Like the 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 loyalists are like, oh, they're here to punish the rebels, and so they're getting more and more encouraged. But then the hammer is going to fall on everybody when they just come in and take. All that they want. Well, they're there to purchase right now. Oh. Because they think that, you know, George is still on their side. I see. Okay. The communication was intercepted and replaced, remember? Right, right. So, yeah, there's no, no fear that, oh, yeah, they're not against us. They're not in trouble yeah. at all. So when these ships first started arriving, the Georgia Committee of Safety immediately ordered the arrest of Wright and other representatives of the Crown. A guy named Joseph Harbersham, who was a major in the Georgia militia, placed him under house arrest and got him to promise that he would not attempt to communicate with the British ships. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, so many questions about... Who is in charge and where the commands are coming from and how do they enforce that? And Well, remember, this is a time where a man's word was his bond. Right. So if you get a promise, the expectation and is that they will do what they say. That's, you know, an, it's an honor-based system. Yes. And these guys were all about honor. That's true. Well, let's continue. I have thoughts about that, but we'll see how it plays out. So, Wright, he was continually harassed while he was under house arrest. And so this made him fear for his life. So he ended up escaping his house arrest on February 11th. And he made his way to a plantation of a Loyalist supporter, and he was spirited off to the Scarborough. Yeah, the, the ship that he wasn't supposed to, like he promised not to talk to, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. while, while this was happening, Georgia's Provincial Assembly had met elected representatives to the Second Continental Congress and started raising a army. I could see that. That's a good time to do that before things get more serious. Yeah, before everything goes hot. Oh, yeah. So when the disgraced governor arrives aboard the Scarborough, he writes a letter to the remaining members of his council, and he expressed frustration over getting assurances of safety 
and access to the desired supplies from the Patriot authorities. That's pretty gentlemanly, I think, expressing your frustration <laughs> via letter. So when the Continental Congress put the ban on trade with Great Britain, this, you know, helped negotiations fail. And that's when Barclay, or Barclay, we don't know exactly yeah. which way the actual pronunciation is. I've heard so it both I'll ways. Yeah. I'll probably end up, you know, flip-flopping. But he orders his fleet to battle on February 29th. His objective was a number of merchantmen docked at Savannah. So on March 1st, the Scarborough, the Tamar, the Cherokee, the Hitchinbrook sailed up the Savannah River to Five Fathom Hole. With them, they brought transports carrying two to three hundred men. So Hitchinbrook and one of the transports then split off and went up the back river. The transport anchored opposite of the port area while Hitchinbrook attempted to take position above the town and ended up grounded on the sand bank in the river. Yeah, this is starting good. Yeah, this is not this is not a complete disaster, but it's it's a mess. Yes. So the rebels opened fire and ended up clearing the Hitchinbrook's decks. Wow. Yeah, people were the guys were like, no, we're going below decks. This is no, I don't like this. No, thank you. Now, the rebels didn't have boats suitable to attempt boarding. So they really couldn't do anything. And when high tide came, the Hitchinbrook was able to be refloated very easily. So the evening of March 2nd, Grant landed his men on Hutchinson Island. And they made their way across it. And at around 0400 on the 3rd, they captured a number of rice boats anchored near the island. No, that's not, that's not a crop I think of with the United States, rice. But I imagine the conditions in Georgia were, you know, they're different than other places like Iowa. So, makes yeah. sense. Now... They were able to actually do this very, very, very quietly. Stealthy, even. Yeah, four in the morning. That's impressive. So because they were able to be quiet, and they're not sure, but they might have actually been able to successfully collude with the captains of the rice boats. Ah, uh, okay. The alarm was not raised in Savannah until 0900. Wow. That is that is very successful, especially mm -hmm. given that the foreign troops don't know the terrain, don't know the waterways. They're able to sneakily do this in the dark and not be caught. That's impressive. Yeah. So when the alarm is finally raised, a guy named Colonel McIntosh takes 300 militiamen and they set up three four-pound cannons on a place called Yamacraw Bluff. He then sends a couple of guys, a guy named Lieutenant Daniel Roberts and Major Raymond Demur II to one of the occupied ships to parlay with them. When they got there, they are promptly arrested. Oh, <laughs> well, so much for a flag of truce wait a minute who's arresting whom in this scenario is it the, the british, british are, ships are arresting are arresting the rebels okay i guess yeah 
they figure they have the authority of the crown so they can arrest anybody in rebellion to said crown, so that makes sense. But you're doing it in Georgia, right? That's They haven't captured the place. They just captured some rice boats, it's, it sounds like, right? I mean, they're, they, they're on land. Okay. They've captured some rice boats. I mean, there's forces... True. Right there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's. It, I'm just trying to get a picture of what's happening because usually uh, invading a territory which you may claim is yours but is populated by a lot of hostile combatants and then saying, well, I'm arresting you, seems like a very bold move. Yeah, let's see how it plays out. So McIntosh sends a larger party of men to attempt the parlay again. To and their main objective is to negotiate the release of the guys that they captured before and the ships. Okay. And it takes a nasty turn when Captain Rogers, who was the leader of the party, was insulted. Honor Bay Society strikes again. Yeah. He ends up firing at someone on one of the ships. And the British respond by opening fire themselves. Wounding one guy and nearly sinking one of the boats that they came on. Do we know what the insult was? So we can no. determine if it was worth kicking up gunfire you dress like your mother she's a fine dresser thank you very much no we don't we don't know what the insult was okay. unfortunately that would i would I'll add that to the list of when i get a time machine figure out this yeah. insult so the boats retreat and McIntosh opens fire with the cannons he had set up on the bluff. This started a battle that lasted for four hours. Ooh. So the Committee of Safety meets, and they decide that the supply ships should be burned. And a company of militiamen were assembled to do this. One supply ship which was called the Inverness, she was set aflame and set to drift towards the occupied vessels. Yep. I'm way ahead of you. Arson. Yes. Arson, drink. I have a feeling it's going to be the first of many this episode. We'll see. Yeah. This caused a scramble as the British troops hurried to abandon them because there's a fire ship coming at them. <laughs> During this, the, the gun battery for the Patriots started raking the British that were trying to abandon ship with musket fire and grape shot. Two of the rice boats were able to get away downstream and two more were able to escape upstream. But these two were forced to dock, and their crews were captured. Ah, uh, okay. Three rice boats were hit by the fireboat and burned into the night. Wow. So that's a lot more rice boats than I had imagined when you first said this. So this, I'm counting, is that nine? Two upstream, two downstream, two docked, three on fire. The two went upstream were the two that docked. Oh, I see. Okay. And this is before steam engine, so that's impressive to go upstream. Yeah. Seven boats in total. Okay. Uh, and the Georgia militia, they actually were helped when 500 South Carolina militia arrived. And they were hungry for action. 
<laughs> Give me one second. Got it. All right. So Colonel McIntosh sends another party to parlay with the British the next day, offering a prisoner exchange. Now, Barclay does refuse the exchange, and, the, and so the Committee of Safety orders the arrest of the remaining members of Wright's Council. This was successful, and the British then agreed to an exchange. Huh. This is a lot more intrigue than we usually see. I guess politicking yeah. and negotiating and kind of... Anyway, this is... Go ahead. So even though the the battle was not on the British favor, they were able to successfully sail most of the merchant ships down to the Black River. Though some did need to dump some cargo in order to make it through the shallows. Once they got to Tybee Island... They moved about 1,600 barrels of rice onto the two British transport ships. Wow. During the negotiations, prisoner exchanges, the fleet stayed off of Tybee Island and detained several vessels that were arriving and took them as prizes. I imagine as if you were a loyalist watching all this go down, you'd start getting that weird feeling in your stomach. Yeah. On March 25th, a band of militia from Savannah burned all of the houses on the island so that Wright couldn't use them. So his officers and himself could not stay in luxurious houses while all this was happening. They had to stay be around the stinky enlisted men. That's... And yes, arson... Hilarious. Drink. Imagine, because, I mean, whose houses were they, right? Did they burn their houses or some houses that were on the island? These were Savannah militiamen, so it was not theirs. Right. But it was still American right. houses. Right, it's like, that's somebody's house, and you're using it, but no more are... Our ire for you is greater than our value for property rights for the average colonist. Oof. Well, I'm sure those guys that had already evacuated somewhere, probably to Savannah. Yeah, that's probably true. So Barkley weighs anchor on March 30th and sails north, leading the convoy and trans of merchant ships and transports. He they put into Newport, Rhode Island. Where, when, when he reaches there, the Patriots say, no, you're not getting any help from us. And as a matter of fact, here's some gunfire. <laughs> it's the opposite of help, I would say. Yeah. So he eventually rejoins the British forces at Halifax in May. So this battle marks the end of British control over Georgia until Savannah is recaptured in December of 78. And Wright comes back triumphant. Oh. And Savannah stays in British hands until 1782. That's a while. Yeah. So that is the Battle of the Rice Boats. Nice. Well, I learned that there were rice boats in Georgia, and that's... I mean, I'm sure a lot of people local to Georgia probably already knew that, but now the world knows. Now the world knows. All right. So we're going to move on to the Frederica Naval Action. Let's see. That sounds like a, a progressive rock group. You know what I mean? <laughs> ah. Yeah. Possibly. So this is going to be with the Georgia Navy versus the United Kingdom Navy. So on April 15th, a guy named Elbert, Samuel Elbert, 
received word that the Royal Navy had been spotted off the coast. And so he took about 360 men of the Georgia Continental Battalion off that were stationed at Fort Howie and had them march to Doreen. From here, they got put on to three galleys, the Washington, the Bullock, and the Lee, which were captained by John Hardy, Archibald Hatcher, and John Cutler Braddock, respectively. So by the middle of April 18th, this flotilla had entered the Frederica River and anchored at Pike's Bluff, which was about a mile and a half above Fort Frederica. They landed troops under Colonel Robert Ray and Major Daniel Roberts, and they landed a artillery detachment under Captain George Young. Elbert ordered Ray to take 100 of his men and march them to the fort, where they took the fort and took the British prisoners, or t they took British prisoners. All right, way to go. Right. So some of the men did escape by boat, and they took word to the Galetta, which is a British boat, and they alerted Captain Thomas Jordan to a American attack. And he responds by sending a ship loaded with soldiers to assist the Hitchinbrook and the Rebecca. Okay. Now, Albert does receive word of the two British ships, but he's like, you know what, guys? It's getting dark. I don't think we really want to attack right now. Let's go ahead and just rest for the night. Okay. So... On the morning of April 19th, with his men well rested, Albert takes the, his galleys down the river to attack these British ships. Now, the thing is, they had the entire night to prepare. And so they are already set up in their order of battle. More than likely, the first shots were fired shortly after first light, around 0530. So they began firing on the Hitchinbrook, the Rebecca, and the Hatter. Mm. Now, here's the thing about galleys. The, they are lightly built craft because they are set up for rowing. So they are fragile and at a severe disadvantage against the strongly built sailing vessels. I was wondering why they chose galleys. I don't know if that was just what was available, but as soon as I heard that, I went, mm, that's going to be a challenge. Well, they have a tactical advantage against sailing vessels in restricted waters when there's no winds. That's true. Yeah, so, I guess maneuvering a giant ship with, in a windless area would be near impossible. It would be impossible. Well, yes, that's, that's closer to impossible than I thought. Yeah. It actually well, is. When your main propulsion is wind and there's no wind, and you, trying to turn with in a restricted place, even if you have wind, with this big boat in this tiny spot, yeah, not, not good. Okay, so I do see the advantage there. But then you're saying that the English had all night to prepare, and so they're ready for whatever's about to come at them, correct? Right. They got set up. Mm -hmm. But either by luck or by planning, there was no wind. So the British ships are not able to sail forward. They are forced to remain stationary. So, the galleys begin by firing a few random shots at the British. And then they're like, you know what? We're just going to anchor here. 
And let's just can cannonade them. <laughs> That's great. The Hitch and Brooke and the Rebecca only had four pounders. So they are outgunned because the galleys have heavier ordnance. So they start, so they pull anchor up and just allow the river to start taking them downstream. Hoping to find a place where they can maneuver and maybe catch some wind. Oh my gosh. They had the, they had assumed that the channel was deep. And so they maneuvered as if it was. And at around 10 hundred, Rebecca became grounded at a place that was called Raccoon Gut. Whoa, what a name. Yeah. And the Hitchenbrook and Hatter soon ran aground as well. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's awful. Now the galleys, they have no maneuverability problems. And so they just started rowing nearer because the British are helpless at this point. Right. And the British see this and they decide to abandon ship. They crowded into the into the the rowboats that they had and quickly row down river to where the Galatica was. That's such a fine example. This conflict is such an interesting example of how what you would think would be an underpowered and outmatched vessel can totally dominate a a situation when when you realize that the superior vessel doesn't have its main source of power. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this was just a minor battle. It didn't have, you know, yeah. too much there to it. But the effect on the people of Georgia was huge. They had just disabled a number of the ships that had been attacking merchant American merchantmen off of South Carolina and Georgia coasts. Coasts. That's that's and really great. I mean, that's what a what a well done action. Yeah. It this action also helped to delay by over eight months, the British attempt to capture Fort Morris. It also demonstrated the effectiveness of galleys when, you know, you have them heavily armed in confined waters. Right. So that is the Frederica naval action. That's excellent. It also sounds like a precursor to the Heimlich Maneuver. You know what I mean? But it's different naval. Anyway. We'll just apply the Frederica naval action. She'll stop choking. Anyway, never mind. Heimlich maneuver. Okay, it's a different naval action. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we have time for one more. Yeah. This actually is only going to be between France and the UK. Oh, well, we all we're know. talking. Go. We're talking about it because it happened off of Virginia. Hmm. So this is taking place in 1781, March 16th. As soon as you said. Between France and UK off the coast of Virginia, I was like, oh, this is going to be a late conflict, like a late in the war frame. But that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, this is after Benedict Arnold switched sides. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, both fleets, they have eight ships in their lines. The British do have an advantage in firepower. They had the 90-gun HMS London. 90. 
Yes. This is the largest ship in both fleets. The French, their largest one is the 84-gun Duke Le Bourgogne. That's, that is, it's not quite 90, but it is massive. The smallest vessel in this battle is the 44-gun Romulus. Okay, this is going to be quite a battle. Yeah. So, on the English side, a guy named Arthunat spots the French fleet northeast of them at around 0600, about 40 nautical miles east-northeast of Cape Henry. So, he orders the fleet to come about, and... The French order their ships to form a line of battle heading west into the wind. At around 0800 to 0900, the winds begin shifting, and visibility is very poor. So, the fleet start maneuvering, and this takes several hours, each of them trying to seek advantage on the weather gauge. So it takes till about 1300 for the wind to stabilize from the northeast. And that means that the British have the weather gauge, the advantage. Okay. And was coming up on the rear of the French line. So the French... They were like, this is not good. And they order a sequence move to bring their lines around in front of the British line. So, of course, he has to surrender the weather gauge. This gives the the British the chance to determine how the attack is going to happen. But this does allow him to position his ships that, in a way, that he could open his lower gun decks. Because now he's going against the wind. It's giving his boats a bit of a list that clears the lower gun decks from the heavy winds, Ah. from the heavy seas. Okay, that's interesting. And the British can't do this because they don't want water in their lower decks. Right. So the British see this, and they maneuver. They attempted to maneuver to avoid this. But unfortunately, they ended up being fully exposed to the French's line of fire. Wow. Hmm. And they suffered significant damage. Three of the ships, the Robust, the Europe, and the Prudent, were pretty much completely dead in the water due to heavy damage to their sails and rigging. The British sent signals up to try to keep their their formation and were able to line up behind the damaged vessels. So the French at this point ordered their boats to start moving again and raked the damaged British ships again. Wow. And then the two fleets separated and went their went their own way. Okay. That's a, what a devastating blow to the British. So the French casualties, 72 dead, 112 wounded. Wow. And the British, 30 dead, 73 wounded. Okay. That's not what I expected. The English pulled into Chesapeake Bay, which frustrated the French because that is not what they wanted them to do. (laughs) And they ended up returning to Newport. And they delivered 2,000 men to reinforce Arnold. Wow. Or the English delivered 2,000 men to Arnold, which is what their mission was, and they returned to New York. And then he was like, you know what? I'm way too old for this crap. 
I'm going to go ahead and retire. Arnold? No. The English commander. Oh, I see. Okay. Ab Abernoff? Yeah, that sounds right. Just call yeah. him good old Abe. Good old Marriott. How about that? There That's we go. his first name. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, General Washington is not happy because the French failed him and wrote a letter mildly, mildly, and that's very important, mildly critical of the French. Okay. The letter is intercepted and published in an English newspaper. This ticked off the French. And the French had a very critical response to Washington for this. <laughs> this battle has been memorialized in a song by Todd Snyder. This was the Ballad of Cape Henry. Huh. We actually have a ship list for this. The British fleet had one, two, eight ships. The Robust, the Europe, the Prudent, the Royal Oak, the London, the Adamant, the Bedford, the America. The Robust had 15 killed, 21 wounded. The Europe, 8 killed, 19 wounded. The Prudent, 7 killed, 24 wounded. And 3 wounded on the Royal Oak, which was the flagship for the retire now retired admiral <laughs> french side they had the conquerant the providence the ardent the neptune the duke de bourgogne the jason the aville and the romulus the conquerant had 31 killed 41 wounded the province one dead seven wounded the Ardent, 19 dead, 35 wounded. The Neptune, 4 dead, 2 wounded. The Duc de Bourgogne, 6 dead, 5 wounded. The Jason, 5 dead, 1 wounded. The Eville, 1 dead, 3 wounded. And the Romulus, 2 dead, 1 wounded. I'm amazed that we have records with that kind of detail that survive. I mean... The Navy was the best record keepers of any of the services. I, am, I imagine they still are. Uh, modern? No. I would think they would probably all be equal. Hmm. I guess... Okay. Well, uh, this requires some digging. Perhaps I'll do a research project. Of record keeping throughout the ages? Just uh, currently... Who, who, whose reports are the most meticulous in the United okay. States? Well, I, I look forward to your report. Okay. It may be a while, as you imagine, those projects do take many government grants and years. So, be patient. Oh, I want it, I want it on my desk next Tuesday. Oh, when you say next Tuesday, is that this coming Tuesday or the Tuesday following that Tuesday? Like Tuesday that just happened. You're late. Oh no. I'm sorry, boss. Yes, next last Tuesday. All right. So next time we have two more battles we're going to talk about. And then we're going to move on to the Caribbean theater. Talk about four battles, and we're done with the American Revolution. Wow. You know, for an eight-year conflict, this has been a whirlwind. Yeah, it, it takes a while. Yeah. Lots of moving parts. So, what we're going to do now is we are going to honor one of our fallen angels with the help of HeroCards.us. Today, we are going to honor Leonard Roy Harmon. He was a mess attendant first class. His hometown was Curo, Texas. 
Served in the U.S. Navy on the USS San Francisco CA-38. CA he received the Navy Cross and a Purple Heart. His date of sacrifice was November 13, 1942. Killed in action north of Guadalcanal on the Solomon Islands. He was 25 years old. Leonard Harmon was born to Cornelius and Naunita Harmon in Curo, Texas, which is a small town southeast of San Antonio. On January 21st, 1917, he graduated from Dole High School at the height of the Great Depression, but managed to find some work doing chores for the William Froby's home, a local historic property. In December of 1937, Leonard Harmon and Eileen Ross welcomed a baby boy. Two years later, in July of 1939, Harmon traveled to Houston and enlisted in the U.S. Navy and sent to training in Norfolk, Virginia. And he was assigned to the heavy cruiser USS San Francisco CA-38 on October 29, 1939. During the late 1930s and early 1940s, the Navy, along with all U.S. military branches, was strictly segregated and offered very few opportunities for advancement for black Americans. Harmon was trained as a mess attendant, which was one of the few duties available. Like most members of a Navy crew, he was also trained in damage control and was assigned a battle station aboard the heavy cruiser, the San Francisco. Was deployed to the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. While at sea, Harmon was promoted to mess attendant first class. On November 12, 1942, in the waters between Guadalcanal and the smaller Savo Island, Harmon's warship was attacked by Japanese aerial assault in, which, in what was to be known as the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal. The San Francisco was one of the American warships protecting transports of marine reinforcements landing on Guadalcanal Island. The pilot of a badly damaged Japanese plane deliberately crashed into the San Francisco's radar and fire control station, killing or injuring 50 men. Wow. Enemy gunfire also killed nearly every officer on the bridge. Without regard for his own safety, Harmon put himself at great risk to evacuate the wounded to a distressing to a dressing station. He was killed while shielding a wounded shipmate from gunfire with his own body. According to Navy records, 77 men were killed on USS San Francisco during the Battle of Guadalcanal. 105 were injured, and 7 were reported missing. The ship was hit 45 times, and 22 fires had to be extinguished. For his extraordinary heroism under fire, Lieutenant Harmon was posthumously awarded the Navy Cross. This citation reads, The President of the United States of America takes pride in presenting the Navy Cross posthumously to Mess Lieutenant First Class Leonard Roy Harmon, Naval Serial Number 3600418, United States Navy, for extraordinary heroism and devotion to duty in action against the enemy while serving on board the heavy cruiser USS San Francisco CA-38, during action against enemy Japanese naval forces near Savo Island on the Solomon Islands on the night of 12-13 to 13 November 1942, with persistent disagreement with persistent disregard of his own personal safety, Mess Attendant First Class Harmon rendered invaluable assistance in caring for the wounded and assisting them to a dressing station. In addition to displaying unusual loyalty on behalf of the injured executive officer, he deliberately exposed himself to hostile gunfire in order to protect a shipmate, and, as a result of this courageous deed, was killed in action. His heroic spirit of self-sacrifice, maintained above and beyond the call of duty, was in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. Buried at sea, Leonard Roy Harmon is memorialized on the walls of the missing in the Manila American Cemetery in the Philippines. On May 21, 1943, Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox announced that a destroyer escort vessel, USS Harmon DE-67, would be named in Leonard's honor. The ship was launched on July 25, 1943, and was the first U.S. warship to be named for a black American. Other honors include the dedication of Harmon Hall, enlisted sailors' quarters at the U.S. Naval Air Station in North Island, California, on July 29, 1975. A state historical marker was dedicated in 1977 at Curo Municipal Park in Texas, 
and the street on the north edge of the park was renamed Leonard Roy Harmon Drive. A poster of Harmon hangs in the Smithsonian Institute's National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. So, mess attendant first class Leonard Roy Harmon, we thank you. Thank you. All right, XO, take us out. All right. So, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to our show. If you want to get in, get a hold of us, let us know what you like, what you don't, what you'd like to hear. There's a couple ways to do that. You can email us at usnavyhistorypodcast at gmail.com. We are also on X, formerly Twitter, with the handle of US Navy History Pod. And we have a Discord. We're on YouTube. We're on many different places. So find us. You can contact us. You can rate us. If you rate us, that helps us. And more people like you will get to hear what we're saying. And, uh, you know, tell a friend, tell a family member. That's, that's how we grow. And we're, we really appreciate your help. We have a subscription now. If you want to support us, you can become a subscriber. And to thank you for that, we are putting out bonus episodes. So if you would like to support us and have more of us in your life, please support us. So as always, we're going to wish you all a fair winds and following season. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye-bye.